Uh, I want to start by thanking the Museum of Flight for inviting me to be here. They've been uh, just fabulous hosts, uh, and I've really enjoyed the experience of being here. So I really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, I wrote this book for, I, I had no intention during my career to write a book. Several of my co co-workers at NASA have journaled all through their careers because they had the intention all along when they retired that they were gonna write a book. That was never my intention. So I had to go on memory. So in the introduction of the book, I actually apologized to my coworkers and said, if I remembered something wrong, it's not because I was trying to deceive anybody, it's because my memory has never been that great and it's certainly not getting better with age. <laughs> so I wanted to write the book for uh, several reasons. Uh, I actually started it in the fall of 19 when uh, my first NASA boss uh, passed away. I thought it would be nice to write a book and dedicate it to him. He had uh, come on board during the Apollo program uh, and had retired uh, basically at the end of the shuttle program. And uh, so that kind of started me thinking in the fall of 19 and then when the COVID lockdown hit, I thought, well, if I'm ever going to do this, now's the time to do it. So I wrote about 90% of it then. Uh, and uh, once things opened up again after the vaccines were available, uh, I got busy again. And so it took me till the end of 22 to actually finish the other 10%. Uh, so it actually came out in December of this past year uh, was the official publication date. And uh, I wrote it uh, to make people aware that there's more to NASA than just engineers and astronauts. That's what people think about when they think about NASA. But there's actually a ton of different expertise that has to go in to a successful space flight. So that's one of the reasons I wrote it. I also wrote it because I wanted to make students, young people, aware of food science as a career path. People know about culinary, they know about cuisine and being a chef. They know about dietetics and being getting a degree in nutrition. Um, but not many people really know about food science as a degree path. And there's a lot of demand for food scientists out in industry. So food scientists work for food companies, they develop new products, they do quality assurance. There's a lot of food scientists in the government, USDA, FDA, so there's a demand out there not too many people know about it, and I actually just stumbled onto it when I was a senior in college because I took an elective in food microbiology and got interested in food science, and that's how I went into food science. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, just tell you a little bit about the food system on Space Station, and uh, you'll be welcome to ask me some questions at the end as well. So this is a picture of the International Space Station. It was taken from one of the last shuttle flights. So this is basically at assembly complete um, when all the different modules uh, uh, were added because it started out as just two little modules in 2020 and then are in 2000 and then it grew. And so uh, assembly complete, but to give you an idea of the size, if you laid this on the ground, it would go end zone to end zone on a football field. So that gives you an idea of how big it is. Uh, the brown things that you see uh, sticking down there, uh, these are the solar uh, arrays. That's what gives the station power. Um, so, um, Beverages. This is how the crew does all the NASA provided beverages go up. So it's a pouch. All the beverages are in powdered form. They're packaged in the food lab at the Johnson Space Center. They're all commercial off the shelf powdered beverages that you can buy in your grocery store. And yes, we still use Tang. And no, we didn't invent Tang. Uh, uh, so many times during my career, I had reporters ask me, so tell me about how NASA invented Tang. Well, NASA didn't invent Tang. They actually just used it because it was on the market. It was commercially available. It was like orange juice and all it required was the addition of water. You didn't have to add anything else to it. Uh, so 
This adapter, this white adapter that you see on the top of the package, it has a septum inside. And the septum is a little plastic valve that has a slit in it. And the slit is where the needle go from the galley goes into the package to allow the water to be injected into the package. When the needle is withdrawn, that slit closes off to prevent that fluid from flowing out of the package. So they're gonna inject the water. Whoops, I did that wrong. Hit the wrong button. They're gonna inject the water, but in order to be able to drink the beverage, they're gonna have to insert this straw into that same slit. The straw has a rigid tip on it to hold that slit open, and then they're gonna sip, and in between sips, they have to close this clamp to prevent the fluid from flowing, the beverage from flowing out of the package. The clamp happens to be a regular commercial off-the-shelf IV clamp. Um, but if you don't clamp it closed, what you'll gradually get is a big ball of beverage forming on the end of the straw, and it, if you knock it off, it's gonna make a huge, big mess. Um, so this, and the material that's used, interestingly enough, when we did the new beverage package, um, it is the same material that Capri Sun was using at the time. But we don't have the cute little printing on the side that Capri Sun has. Uh, the other big category of food that uh, we have uh, is freeze-dried items. And this is what people always think about when they paint, think about space food, because they've seen the companies in the, in the store that make the, like the freeze-dried ice cream and the stuff that they sell in the visitor center at the at Smithsonian and here probably. And <laughs> but uh, so the freeze drying is all done um, at the Johnson Space Center. And these are all custom formulations now. When I first started working at NASA in the eight, mid 80s, they were buying camping products, the same products that you can buy in camping stores, freeze dried. Uh, and we use those through the shuttle program. But the problem with those products is that they're really high in salt. Uh, and they, the, they do that uh, to help preserve, but also salt makes it taste really good. Uh, but when we went and had crew members staying long duration in space, the high sodium was a real negative because in microgravity there tends to be bone loss. Uh, and the crew members have to exercise a lot when they're in orbit to offset that tendency to lose bone and muscle mass. And the high salt diet it would exasper exacerbate that bone loss, make it worse. And so at that point, we had to start doing our own formulations. So our food scientist in the food lab at Johnson, we developed uh, formulations and started making our own freeze-dried products. Uh, they're packaged, in that, they're packaged in that pouch. Uh, and again, it's got the same adapter at the top. And the label tells them how much water to add and about how long they have to wait for it to pro uh, properly rehydrate. Once it's rehydrated and the product has absorbed the water, they're able to cut across here with scissors and just eat out of the package with a fork or a spoon, depending on what the product is. Um, the trick about eating in space is you, can't, you don't really want to cut all the way across. You want to leave it attached, otherwise you got a piece of trash you got to deal with somehow in microgravity. So they learn pretty quickly. Uh, you'll notice we have barcodes on the label. Those were added uh, early in the shuttle program because uh, some of the experiments required the crew members to track what they ate. And so rather than having them, the first couple of times that occurred, they actually kept a handwritten journal. And then it's like, oh no, we need to put a barcode reader on board so that they can automatically do it. And over time, that has progressed to uh, an app. You know, there's an app for everything. Well, now they have an app on orbit that allows them to track everything they eat, including the calories. They can look and see calories and certain nutrients as well. Uh, but the car, that's why the barcode was added. But we were also able to use it in, in the food lab because the barcode, the first part of the barcode tells you what the product is. You can look, it's, it's a, called a smart barcode. So you can look at that number and know 
that it's freeze-dried eggs or whatever it is. But then the second part of that number is unique to that actual package. And so if we were ever to have an issue with a lot and had to do a recall, like you hear about food companies doing recalls, we would know exactly which packages to tell the crew members, don't, don't eat those, there's a problem with those. We never actually had to do that during my career, but we certainly had the capability to do that if we needed to. Uh, when we started partnering with the Russians, we added Cyrillic. They demanded that we put the, food, the name of the food and the instructions in, in Cyrillic. Uh, and that led to some interesting uh, translational issues. I can remember uh, they, the, we had a product called Fiesta Chicken, freeze-dried. And I think most people would know that Fiesta Chicken means it's got Southwest spices in there, right? The first time we had the Russian cosmonauts come into the lab and we did a food session with them for them to try the products, the question I got, what is a party chicken? <laughs> <laughs> they did not understand. They also had a product in their uh, line of foods, because the Russians have their own dedicated company that makes their space food for their cosmonauts. That product, translated into English, was appetizing appetizer. So that told you nothing about what the product was. Uh, we also have a large category of thermostabilized products. These are just like your canned foods, but they're done in pouches instead of cans. The pouch technology was invented by the military for the Meals Ready to Eat program. Uh, if you're familiar with MREs, all of their entrees are gonna be packaged like this. The military wanted to get away from cans because they're so heavy and they have to ship food all over the world. Uh, NASA loved pouches for the same reason. And when we first started again on shuttle, uh, we were buying MRE entrees. Whatever the MRE people were making for the military, those are the entrees we were buying and using. Again, they're really high in salt, really high in fat. Now the military has good reason to have the salt and fat in there. They want the food to be calorically dense. So a lot of calories, a lot of fat, because they want those the soldiers to get a lot of energy when they eat those products. And the salt, again, helps with preservation and makes it taste really good. Plus, in the desert, when they're sweating and losing those electrolytes, they need the salt. Uh, so when we went to space station, the original plan was that there was gonna be a US only space station, space station freedom. And I, when I was hired as a contractor in 1985, I was actually hired to help uh, formulize and develop that frozen, and we thought it was gonna be frozen, frozen food system. Um, but when uh, the, in the mid 90s, when the engineers started looking at how much power they were gonna get from the solar arrays, they told the ISS program, you can either have freezers for science or you can have freezers for food. Well, we were back to an all shelf stable food system. And when that happened, we knew we were gonna have to get rid of those high salt, high fat MREs. So we, again, we started developing our own products and pouching them uh, and retorting them uh, at our retort facility. And we actually ended up uh, establishing that at Texas A&M. Um, we put out an RFP uh, request for proposal and several different groups bid, but A&M won the bid. They had a facility, they have an electron beam facility there uh, where they can irradiate food, but they had empty space in it and so they submitted a plan for us to set up our retort facility there because we could not get space at Johnson Space Center for it at all. And it's close enough, it's a couple, couple of hours from JSC, so it's close enough to make it viable to go back and forth. So we established that facility in um, February of 2008, and we've been producing food there ever since. These products are all ready to eat, just like your canned products. All they're gonna do is if they need warming, they're gonna warm them up. If not, they're just gonna cut them open and eat them right out of the package with a fork or a spoon. We have a few, NASA has a few intermediate moisture products. These are products like dried beef, dried fruit. 
they've had enough moisture removed to make them microbiologically stable without refrigeration, but there's still enough moisture in them that they don't have to add water back prior to consumption. They just consume as is. Uh, these products we call natural form simply because they fly in their natural form, and they're all commercial off-the-shelf products that NASA buys and repackages. And so they, the repackaging, I always get the question, why bother to repackage? Well, there's several reasons. One is that these products are all dry. And so they're going to float in microgravity. And so if you have them in a big bulk package and the crew opens it on orbit, it's going to be very difficult for them to deal with it. So by packaging in single serving portions, by packaging in single serving portions, they can just cut across a corner, work a few out, and they can manage it a whole lot more successfully. Uh, plus, any material that you put in a spacecraft in significant quantity has to be off-cast and tested for chemicals that it might be releasing into the air because they're in a closed environment and whatever gets into the air, they're going to be breathing for a really long time. And so rather than trying to test all these different packages, it's a lot more cost-effective for it to be repackaged in a material that's already approved. So that's what we do. Uh, we also have a few meat products that are irradiated to shelf stability. Rather than thermostabilized being made shelf stable by heat, these are made shelf stable by actual radi uh, irradiation. Um, and we actually have special permission from the USDA and FDA through to the Code of Federal Regulations to irradiate these products to a level of shelf stability. They function just like thermostabilized. They're ready to eat. All they got to do is heat them up. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. And NASA has used irradiated foods on more than one occasion during the history. They even used them early during the Apollo program, but now they just have these few meat products left. Um, condiments are also very popular part of the diet. Um, commercial on shuttle, we just use the, the regular restaurant style like you get, uh, and that was fine for the shorter flights. But now on orbit, because they're there for so long, uh, and we do have a very small chiller on board where they can chill uh, leftover condiments, and so we now can use the larger squeeze bottles, and so those go to orbit. Uh, the only thing that's kind of unique about the condiments is the salt and pepper. It has to be in liquid form. So the salt is dissolved in water, the pepper's dissolved in a food grade oil similar to a cooking oil, and so it's in a dropper bottle. They have to squeeze a drop, touch it to the food, and stir it in. Um, they can't have the powder because it would get in their eyes and actually they might breathe it in if it got loose. And so it has to be in liquid form. Now, uh, the condiments are, especially hot sauce, very popular on orbit. A lot of our astronauts tell us they feel like their taste buds are somewhat dulled when they're on orbit. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. We haven't been able to quantify that in, in any kind of scientific experiment. So it's all just anecdotal. And some of the crew members say, oh, you're crazy. It doesn't taste different on orbit than it does on the ground. But about half of them feel like, yes, it tastes a little different. And you can kind of, I can rationalize why that would be true, because on orbit, you're eating out of a package rather than eating off a plate. And so that right there is, it, it's detracting from the amount of aroma that you're getting from the food. Uh, and you all know that aroma is critical to the way food tastes. All you have to do is get a cold and have your nose stopped up, and you can't get as much aroma through the back of your nose, and so everything tastes different when, you have a, when you're congested. So um, the fact that they're, they're not getting as much aroma from the food when you heat food on the ground, it all comes up off the plate. Roma comes with it. On orbit, when they heat, it's going to dissipate in different directions. So they're actually going to lose some of the aroma that way. Plus, they're in a closed environment with a lot of other competing odors. 
so which can detract from them getting odor from the food. So all of that taken together, it's not too hard to imagine that they would feel like their taste buds are somewhat dulled. And so that's why hot sauce is really popular. And during, our, uh, during the shuttle program, and even today, one of the most popular items is our freeze-dried shrimp cocktail because it has a powdered sauce, tomato-based sauce that goes with it. It's got horseradish in it, so it's got a nice little kick. Um, and so, you know, on orbit, that's going to taste really good. Uh, I included this. This is actually a split pea soup in thermostabilized pouch. But the reason I showed this is because when we prepare products for Orbit to go in the pouches, they have to be viscous. They have to be pretty thick. Um, you can't really have a real liquidy product or it's going to be difficult to deal with. And so, uh, yeah, it has to stick to that pouch or stick to the utensil in order for it to function well in microgravity. Um, the most popular bread product on board is flour tortillas. And so this is the point where I tell you, I think in the, in the advertisement for this, they said what it's like to make a sandwich on orbit. Well, when I came to work at NASA as a contractor in 1985, they would fly on the shuttle sliced bread for them to make sandwiches with. Uh, just regular off the grocery store shelf, they would put it in Ziploc bags and send it to orbit. Well, not too long after I came to work there, a um, Mexican payload specialist flew on a shuttle flight, and he wanted to take tortillas. Uh, he wanted to take corn tortillas, so he took tortillas with him, and when he saw how easy it was to wrap something up, and it was like having a sandwich without having to deal with two pieces of bread and all the crumbs that they created. From then on, they were like, forget the bread, send the tortillas. And the interesting thing was, though, being gringos, most of them, they wanted flour, not corn, right? Yeah. So flour tortillas became extremely popular. And when the shuttle flights were short, it was easy um, to accommodate that. We would just go out. Um, and we actually bought them in the Houston area because at that time there really weren't tortilla factories right around Kennedy Space Center. Um, and so there were plenty in Houston. So we went and just took samples from a bunch of them, chose the one that had the, the best, that was the cleanest, least yeast, least mold, so that they would last the longest. Bought them, we would put them on the plane that took the crew down to launch about three days before launch. Um, and so fresh tortillas went on board. That was great, no, no issue. Um, but then the flights got longer and the tortillas wouldn't really last till the end. And so we're like, okay, uh, the crew was like, we want tortillas on day 16, just like we want tortillas on day one and two. So we knew that the, that the military made a shelf-stable bread, several shelf-stable bread products. A company in San Antonio, Texas, called Sterling Foods, manufactures what they call shel uh, extended shelf-life bread. So we knew the technology that they used to do that. They package it anaerobically without oxygen so that no yeast and no moles can grow. So it lasts for like two years. Um, but they have, to, they have to modify the dough to reduce the water content, uh, to bind more of the water so that anaerobic bacteria can't grow. But they had that technology down pat, but they didn't make tortillas. So we started making our own extended shelf life tortillas in the lab. So we had the dough press, the dough divider, the whole bit. We did that for a few years, and ours would last about four months. And then they would develop a bit of a bitter aftertaste. But four months for shuttle was great because the flights were short. We could make them fresh for every flight. When we went into space station, we're like, OK, we're going to have to figure out what's causing that bitter flavor because we're going to need more than four months for space station. And about that time, I think it was Taco Bell, came out with a kit in the grocery store to make soft tacos. And they had the tortillas in the kit. And, we're, and it had a nine-month shelf life. And we're like, that's got to be 
and extended shelf life. You know, that's gotta be a low water activity tortilla. It's the only way they could do it. So sure enough, we got some, tested it, low water activity. So we started, we figured out who was making it for them, started buying those and packaging them. So we got out of the tortilla manufacturing business, which was fine by us. And so for years, we just bought and repackaged. And then a few years ago, the military starts coming out. Sterling Foods has a packaged tortilla. So we got samples, and we had a sensory in the lab, and everybody tried them. And some people said, oh, I think ours is better. Other people said, nah, the military is this better. Some said, I can't tell the difference. Well, when we researched it, we found out military wasn't making them. They were buying them from the same people we were making, buying them from and repackaging them. So now we, we, don't, we just buy them already packaged and send them to Orbit, and they have a two-year shelf life, and that works great. Uh, this is a bulk overwrap bag, better known as a Bob. So. NASA has acronyms for everything, and so the food lab had to get in on that as well. So we send up, the food lab sends up bobs of food. And so to give you an idea, this is roughly 15 by 12 by five. So it holds quite a bit of food. If you packed, it's probably about three days worth of meals for one person if you packed it that way, but that's not how it's packed. So NASA has a, what they call a standard menu that they send to orbit. It has about 200 different foods and beverages in it, so an incredible amount of variety. And it's packaged pantry style. So there's eight different categories. We package all, they package all the meat together, all the vegetables together, all the fruits together. And so they're gonna have one of those open all the time on orbit. And so when they go to eat, even though it's a standard menu, they're not eating per a menu. They just go and select what they want for that particular meal from those eight different categories. In addition to that, each crew member who stays on orbit for six months is going to get nine bobs like this that, they, that are called preference bobs. They're gonna choose the items that go in there. So typically what they put in there if they like a particular part, an item from our standard menu, and they wanna eat it really often, they're gonna to have to put extra in their preference containers because those eight categories are being shared with all the other crew members that are on board. Plus, if they come from Europe or Japan or Canada and they're an international crew member and their country wants to send some items, then they're gonna send those and we're gonna pack those in their preference containers. They're also gonna get five bobs like this for preference beverages. And so if they're coffee and tea drinkers, on orbit, all you can do is add hot water. And so they have to tell us, do they want their coffee black? Do they want it with artificial sweetener, cream and sugar? So we have to do all that ahead of time. That's gonna go in their preference beverage containers. And if they're not coffee or tea drinkers, then they can choose other items, uh, other beverage items to put in those containers as well. So altogether, they're gonna get about 14 preference containers to augment that standard menu. Um, this is a picture taken in the food lab at the Johnson Space Center, and it's during a sensory evaluation. So the crew members come in and they try the different products. So on shuttle, they used to get the food in simulators on the ground. When they were in the fixed space simulator training, if they were there for more than about five hours, they would get a, a shuttle meal. And so they got to try the food real time. That doesn't happen for the International Space Station. So the only way they're gonna see the food prior to arriving on the space station and get to try it is they come to our lab for about four different sessions at lunchtime, and we're gonna do about 50 items a session. So they're gonna try a little bit of taste of everything just to acquaint them with the food, and they're gonna score it on a score sheet. And the score sheet serves two functions. One, we can look at that and see which items are popular, which have good acceptance, which aren't, you know, aren't doing so well. But plus, when they go back to choose their preference, they can look back at those scores and say, oh yeah, I really like this, I wanna put some extra in. 
Uh, each crew member gets their own uh, utensil kit uh, because there's no dishwasher, no sink to sanitize. They just have to use wipes after the meal. So we want them to be able to, to uh, not share utensils. So each one has a kit, uh, their own utensil kit. Um, this is a picture of the galley on the International Space Station. And what you see here is the rehydration station. So this is where they're gonna dial up the amount of water that, that, that the package tells them to add. They get two choices on the water, either room temperature or hot. And so they're gonna inject the water and there's a needle there that they're gonna insert that adapter into. Um, they have, do have a small chiller um, that's left over, or actually I think that's the chiller, that's left over, for, it's a science chiller that they've converted. And so if they want a chilled beverage after they exercise, they actually have to plan ahead, rehydrate it with ambient water, stick it in the chiller so that after they fly, um, they can uh, have a chilled beverage. And th this chiller is about the size of a typical home microwave, so it's very small. They also have an oven, and I think I have a picture. There's a close-up of the rehydration station. This is actually taken in the trainer on the ground. And then this is a picture of the oven. And so these are hot plates. So it's a, co a con convection type or conduction type oven. So it heats by contact. They actually have to clamp the package to the hot plate and warm it up that way. No microwave on orbit. We thought, when we had frozen food, we thought we were gonna have a microwave, but the problem with a microwave is it can interfere with all the other electronics on board. And by the time you shield it enough to keep it from interfering, it weighs so much that it's not practical. And so people say, oh, no, no microwave popcorn. No, sorry, don't microwave popcorn on the space station. Uh, this is what their dining table looks like. It actually folds into the wall, but the, the, they use Velcro and straps to attach everything to the table. And then I just have some photos. Uh, fresh food is, is, of course, a big deal because they miss that. They don't get a lot of it. So anytime a cargo flight goes to the space station, anytime it's practical, there will be some fresh food on board. And it's like Christmas when it gets there. Um, because and it's going to be things like citrus and apples, stuff that will last a while uh, without refrigeration. Because it... Even though it's coming up on a cargo flight, it might have had to have been put on that flight days before the actual launch. Um, so it's always a big deal. Uh, I included this photo. This is Sergei Krikalev, and this, he was the first cosmonaut to fly on the shuttle when we started the shuttle mirror program. And so he's eating some Japanese shelf-stable food out of a pouch with chopsticks, you know, so I, this just, I include it for the international flair of, of uh, how, how different, difficult it, or different it was to have all these different people on board the shuttle. Sergey, if I'm not mistaken, is now head of Star City, which is their equivalent of the Johnson Space Center, where the cosmonauts train. And this last photo that I have was actually emailed to me by a crew member on orbit. He used the flat, wheat flatbread from the military. He put the squeezed cheese on it and some olives. And this was his attempt at a happy face to tell me it was his way of thanking us for some special stuff that we had sent in his preference container. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm gonna ask if anybody has questions that they would like to come forward and ask. Or he's got a microphone, too. Yeah, what we'll do, since we're filming the program, if you have any questions for Vicki, please do come down to the front here and ask them into a microphone. That way we can capture the audio for the recording. Uh, if you don't want to get up and walk all the way to a microphone, just raise your hand and I can bring you this one. And uh, I'll start as our first question asker is coming down. You talked about favorite foods. Was there an absolutely least favorite food that um, astronauts <laughs> did not want to ever see again? Well, it depended on who you talked to. It was interesting because after debriefs, 
I mean, after flights, we would have a debrief with every crew. And when they came back from shuttle or they come back from an ISS increment, um, they'll have a debrief with all the different hardware groups. So the camera people, the you know clothing people, the food people, and we'll ask, get feedback from them. How did it go? And uh, so it was interesting to hear because you'd have seven shuttle crew members sitting there and one of them would say, I mean, and the, there was criticism, but it was usually constructive criticism. You know, you really should consider taking this off the menu. It's not so good. And as soon as they said it, somebody would pipe up, that's my favorite. Why would you want to tell them to take that off the menu? So just like any other group of people, very diverse opinions about what they liked and what they didn't like. So, but over the years, yes, we have found through looking at those score sheets and from feedback from debriefs, they have taken that standard menu and over the years substituted stuff out and in uh, based on the feedback get that they've gotten. But it's, it's hard to point to one item and say it's the least favorite. You know, it's easier to say what was really popular, like that shrimp cocktail I told you about. We had one shuttle astronaut. So shuttle was an all personal preference menu. You chose exactly what you wanted for every day. And that weren't great on shuttle because the food and the crew members were on the same vehicle. That didn't work when we went to space station because we were sending it up by cargo flights and those would get delayed. And so the crew members would say, part of the time I had to eat somebody else's food and I didn't like what they chose. So that's why we went to a standard menu. Um, but, you know, the, the, and I, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, but uh, the, de the food uh, was always uh, a, a big point as far as the uh, psychological aspect of flying, because on shuttle, nobody cared about the food, really, not much. Short flight, camping trip, no big deal. Once we went to long duration space flight, that totally changed. Um, so yeah, they quickly realized if you're up there for six months, what you're eating becomes a lot more important than a two week shuttle flight. I, have, I saw that uh, in your picture of the sodium and pepper solution, there was no barcode, and knowing that sodium is so well controlled, mm -hmm. they have to also log like the drops of sodium. Yes, they actually, in, on the app, they actually have a way to do that if they're adding, yeah. So initially, they didn't have that, but once they got the app, yes, they actually have a way for them to, it'll quiz them if they're using it. They have to at least estimate how many how many drops they're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is there much difference between irradiated food and the thermostabilized food? Yes. Uh, no. I mean, it basically functions in the same way. When you have a can product, or in our case, a pouch product, you're putting it in a um, in a, a piece of equipment called a retort, and the retort uses heat and pressure to kill all the bacteria inside that can or pouch. So you're sealing the product prior to it being processed. So once it's processed in the retort, it's considered commercially sterile. And so we collect data on every uh, run that we do in the retort, and it goes to what's called a uh, commercial verifier, and they look at the data to make sure adequate pressure, adequate heat to have killed everything. So instead of using heat in the case of irradiation, it's the irradiation that kills the product. Now, are the bacteria in the pouch. And so it functions pretty much in the same way. The product is sealed in the pouch. It, in this case, it has to be frozen prior to treatment. And the reason you freeze it is because if you irradiate at room temperature, it can actually create some off flavors in the product. And so by having it treated at a frozen state, that uh, prevents uh, and greatly reduces any off flavors in the product. But you end up with a product that's commercially sterile, just like, so it's gonna function the same way a canned product would. I, have you had to accommodate vegans 
<laughs> no. <laughs> You're probably going to have to. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. You may have to soon. Yeah, we may have to soon. But right now, there is not a way that, you know, the way the food system is set up, there's not a way to accommodate a vegan. We don't have enough products uh, to be able to support a vegan for six months on board. We just, we don't have that. Uh, we never could uh, accommodate halal or, you know, I mean, we just haven't been able to do that up until now. Uh, even I can remember when uh, Eli and Ramon flew, um, he took some, um, you know, he took some food um, that went with the Jewish tradition, but he wasn't able to do his entire menu that way. And so that is something that NASA may, you know, have to face in the future, but so far have not had had not had to do that, but that is something they may have to think about. But at the same time, I can tell you the engineering types are going to say, if you want to do it, you know, you're going to have to suck it up and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it'll be interesting to see how that battle goes in the future, but you're right, that's something they're going to have to think about, potentially. Any other questions? Oh, please. I have a quick question about food waste. So all, all types of food waste, I'm, I'm curious, curious about how that's handled, if it's just kind of shipped out. How trash in general is handled, yeah. So uh, basically it burns up on reentry. <laughs> so, so the progress is one of the, and SpaceX also has cargo vehicles, and so does uh, Northrop Grumman now. I almost said Orbital Sciences, but Northrop took over and changed the name of that company. Uh, those are cargo vehicles that go up, but never come home. They get burned up on reentry. And so basically, like when a Progress goes up in docks, it's gonna be loaded with good stuff. Uh, over the three or four months that it's there, that's gonna be offloaded gradually. And as it's emptied, the trash goes in and fills it up. And so when the next progress is gonna come, they're gonna jettison it and it, so it's, they, these cargo vehicles that don't return, they serve as the giant trash cans in the sky. And everything, everything goes in them. I mean, not just food trash. Uh, we often have to tell the astronauts you know, they're so focused on the thermostabilized products being, uh, being commercially sterile, that they forget that these freeze-dried products are not. The, the freeze-drive have spoilage bacteria in them. And so once they add that water, they're gonna have to uh, either eat that food or throw it in the trash, because they don't have a refrigerator for leftovers. And so we have to remind them, you know, during my career we would have to occasionally remind them and I remember one story, and I do talk about this in my book. We, a shuttle was going to launch and bring home a crew member who had been on space station for quite a while. And so one of the crew members on the shuttle flight came to me in crew quarters when they were in quarantine and said, could we send a hamburger? He really wants a hamburger. He's been emailing me. Could we send it, put it in the fresh food locker? It would only be a couple of days before he ate it. And I, what I wanted to tell him was, think about it. Would you really eat a hamburger that had sat on your kitchen counter at room temperature for two days? I'm like, but no, I told him, I said, you know what? We'll have a nice juicy burger waiting for him at KSC when he lands. But I cannot imagine anything more horrible than getting a foodborne illness in microgravity. <laughs> We've all experienced those on the ground, and you can imagine how much worse it would be without gravity. Any, any other questions? Yay. Hey, Jared. Friend hey. of mine. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned before about uh, trying to get young people into this, you know, yeah, in diff, and into food have, science. Yeah, uh, what should we tell our friends that have kids and all that kind of stuff uh, to help pursue this food, food science? So probably the easiest way to get information about food science as a career is to go to ift.org. So IFT, Institute of Food Technologists, is the professional organization for food science. And they have quite a bit of information on their website 
four students who are interested in food science, shows you which universities have degree plan, you know, degree pass and offer degrees, and uh, gives you a lot of information about people who work in the food industry. So my job, very unique in the food industry, uh, but when I was on the board of directors of IFT, I met so many people in the food industry who um, could point to products and say, you know, I worked at PepsiCo, I developed that product. It's still being sold on the shelves. And so even though I consider my job cool, I thought, man, that would be neat too, you know, to have created a product that you could point to uh, and say, you know, I, I got that off the ground. Um, I was just wondering what your favorite food product has been that you've like, developed so far. Oh, so out of the ones, yeah. So I like several of them. In fact, I participated in a ground-based study where I ate flight food for a month. That's all I ate. Uh, and so, uh, but probably my favorites, when we started developing the thermostabilized products, uh, to replace the MREs, we all sat around the table, all the food scientists and, we, and the dietitian, and we said, what do we want to start with, you know? Do we want it to be an entree, do we want? And believe it or not, the conclusion we came to, even from the dietitian, was desserts. Because at that point, we did not have, all we had for desserts was like M&Ms and cookies, nothing that you could warm up. And we said, from a psychological perspective, if you're on orbit for months at a time, you know, what a plus it would be to have a dessert that you could actually warm up. And so that was the first thing we formulated, even though from a logical perspective, you would say it's not the healthiest thing we could have formulated, but everybody knew it would be a big hit. And so when we formulated it, one of the first things we did, we did a, like a blueberry cobbler, um, and we did a chocolate pudding cake. And the chocolate pudding cake, my favorite, for sure. I'm a chocolate geek. So uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was really cool. And when we first developed these products, we were restricting them just to the astronauts that were going to the space station. So we had astronauts that were still flying on the short shuttle flights and then the ones that were going for months. And we were gonna restrict all these products and say just for the long duration. That lasted about a month. And then the crew members, the shuttle crew members were like, oh no, we get it, we get it too. So we had to scale up our production so we could provide it to everybody. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I think, uh, given our time, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to have to call it good here. Um, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with the story of Apollo 13, where they had to cobble together <laughs> the, um, the uh, air filter out of just whatever they had on board. Are you aware of any time that space food has been used for anything other than its intended purpose? Oh, wow. Well, uh, gee, not that I can recall. Not that I can recall off the... Now, oh, I can recall one story. So Peggy Whitson, um, she... Uh, I, I talked earlier about how the shrimp cocktail was very popular, right? She would take it in her preference container. She did not like it. But she took it because she could use it to bribe fellow crew members to do stuff. So she always included it in her preference container. She was one of the few who didn't like it. So yeah, it was used as currency. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big round of applause for Vicki. Vicki, thank you so much for coming to the Museum of Flight today. You're welcome.